We're delighted to welcome Lisa. Um, she's uh, part of a group in Colorado who um, pioneered the idea of crisis informatics and the, the use of social media back in 2007 when they all really didn't exist. It was just starting to emerge, so they traced with their research how, how this um, emerged and how it has developed. So I'm really excited that you're here and Hi. it's giving a talk um, at a workshop that we're organizing in Brussels on Thursday on information infrastructuring for disaster risk management. So yeah, I'm really looking forward to hear what you've got to say next. So. Great, thank you. Okay, so I'll go ahead and get started. Um, thank you for inviting me here today. Um, I'm visiting from the University of Colorado in Boulder, where I did my research as part of the U.S. National Science Foundation funded grant um, looking called Project EPIC. And EPIC looks at how social media and communication technology have changed the way that people communicate and share information in disaster um, and the implications this has for the design and development of new solutions. My research focuses specifically on the challenges that emergency responders face in integrating social media into their formal emergency management communications. Uh, and much of my research has looked at a grassroots movement from within emergency response called a, a Virtual Operational Support Team, or VOST, and so that's the focus of my talk. So before I jump into the details, I want to give you some background on the challenges that led to the development of the idea of a virtual team. Um, I'm going to talk about the origin of the idea and an evaluation we did of the first emergency trial. I'm also going to talk about research that I've done within this community to understand how the concept has evolved and grown over time. Um, and I'll conclude with some reflections on what I think are the important takeaways from this idea. And then finally, this is really two talks together. It's a talk about virtual operational support, which will give you some framing for understanding the second part of the talk, which is I want to introduce you to a collaboration that I'm doing, an ongoing collaboration project that I have with this community. When I first began my research in 2011, um, the use of social media in emergency management was highly controversial. There was a widespread distrust within the emergency management community and a belief that social media was really just a hotbed for misinformation and rumor. Um, more generally, at that time, there was a lack of support within emergency management organizations. There were no resources allocated, no funding, tools, or official sponsorship for the idea. In addition, in the US, there was a poor fit between the informal nature of social media communications and the formal command and control models that official, um, that emergency responders were forced to use, or that they used. And in some cases, organizations had strict mandates in place that prohibited the use of social media altogether. As these channels were gaining popularity, there was an increasing pe um, pressure from within the public that emergency responders should use social media to share emergency information. And also, at the same time, there was a growing community with an emergency response that felt like the use of social media for emergency communications was both valuable and necessary. But social media was a huge unknown for emergency responders, where there are typically clearly defined pro operational processes and protocols. There was no roadmap for how to make use of these new channels as part of emergency communication. So given these constraints, and inspired by examples of emerging digital volunteerism, an emergency manager in New Mexico named Jeff Phillips came up with a new approach. His idea was in the event of a large-scale event, the teams on the ground's resources are often fully extended. And so the idea was that they could make use of and leverage a team, the support of a team of trained and trusted digital volunteers to help them with both social media monitoring and communications. Unlike spontaneous digital volunteers, this team would be predefined, so defined ahead of time and made up of colleague, trusted colleagues from within emergency management with a combination of both emergency management skills and also the social media skills to manage social media communications. He called this team a Virtual Operational Support Team, or VOST, 
And in the spring of 2011, he formed Vost Osborne from a, te a distributed team of his most trusted colleagues in emergency management. He introduced the idea that same spring at a National Emergency Management Association conference and conducted it as, as a proof of concept exercise where the idea gained some momentum. One of the attendees at this conference was a federal PIO named Chris Erickson, who saw Vost as a potential workaround for the challenges that she was facing. In late August, when she was called to the Shadow Lake Fire in Eastern Oregon, a fire that was in a remote location with a limited impact on the surrounding communities, she, saw that she felt that the circumstances for right, were right for trying out this new idea. And so as she was on the way to the fire, she enlisted the help of, of Jeff Phillips and his team, and Shadow Lake became the first emergency trial of the Vost. I first learned about the Shadow Lake Boss shortly after it happened, and they invited me attend, to attend their after action review in New Mexico. And to evaluate, what they, to evaluate what they'd done, we performed a mixed methods case study, interviewing the members of the team and analyzing both their internal documents and communications and their public facing social media communications during the fire. As a federal PIO, Chris Erickson faced a strict mandate that prohibited her from using any form of social media to communicate with the public. She saw the Vost as a way of bending the rules. What she did was she positioned the Vost team as knowledgeable outsiders, communicating with the public on the incident management team's behalf. This allowed her to maintain a level of separation between the official team and the Vost. She reports that she knew she was bending the rules and also potentially risking her job in this first emergency trial, but she felt like the risk was worth it in order to be able to communicate with the public more effectively. In this first trial, we observed that the Vost had invented both a new organizational structure for handling social media and also a new role. Members of the team worked in shifts to monitor social media and mainstream media communications for actionable information, and also to maintain the social media presence surrounding the fire. And our analysis of their chat communications revealed that there was a tight coordination between the Voss team and the team on the ground, and also a high level of camaraderie. Each of the members of the of the Shadow Lake Boss considered this first trial to be a success, but they were also willing to admit that they were reluctant to say anything negative because they felt like they were campaigning for a new idea in a really hostile environment. Some of the key benefits that they identified were an extension of resources during a large scale event. And because these resources were not on the ground or local, they could focus on social media without the risk of being drawn away a disaster. It also allowed them to expand the hours of coverage. So an example of that is one member of the team was on the East Coast, and so she would get up and catch up on social media communications that happened through the night and send a report to Chris Erickson so that she'd have the latest information as she headed into her morning meeting, the morning briefing. In addition, we felt like the characteristics of this virtual team also contributed to their success. The team was small, there was an extended project duration that fostered strong working relationships between the members, and they had strong leadership through Jeff Phillips. Each of these members had worked with one another in the past, and they possessed a high level of the necessary skills, and their objectives for Shadow Lake was, were clearly defined. We did feel, however, that moving forward with this idea, they would have to do it slowly and that it could be potentially risky, risky on larger scale events where there was more social disruption. So following this first trial, the number of teams grew quickly and the founding members of the, of the Voss community grappled with how to, balance, how to strike a balance between maintaining a cohesive vision of Voss while at the same time supporting innovation and experiments at the individual team level. To understand BOST as it was evolving, I worked within this community as both a participant and a researcher, and in many instances collaborated 
on the development of, and evaluation of new ideas. As part of my work with VOST, I've worked as a member of eight different teams and I've participated in over 50 emergency activations. So this map shows where VOS teams are currently active or in development worldwide. And what started originally as Jeff Phillips, Jeff Phillips' idea of a predefined team and bounded has evolved into a, net, a, a virtual network of teams where members share ideas and practices and often teams members should, team members within this community work across teams and lend resources and expertise as needed. So now I'm going to shift to discussing um, FOSS as a community and, the, and community practices. So in the spring of 2012, the founding members of VOST formed the VOST Leadership Coalition, which they refer to as a coalition of the willing. It's organized by the VOST team leads, but membership is open to anyone willing to participate in the exchange of ideas and the evolution of virtual operational support as a concept. So members include the team leaders, members of the VOST community, but also a wide membership across other digital humanitarian organizations. Um, and they feel strongly that the purpose of the Leadership Coalition was not about defining or standardizing specific operating procedures, but about maintaining a cohesive vision and sharing lessons learned with one another while giving the individual teams the freedom to define the processes that will allow them to align closely with the teams on the ground and the context they were working within. The coalition meets once a month and they publish their agenda as a crowdsourced document, allowing anyone who wants to to contribute to this agenda. The start of each meeting it, um, operates as an a test of their emergency broadcast system. So they have, they have a system set up to send a message to each of the team leads and each communicates back so that they know that they can stay in contact in case of a large scale event. The primary, and so the primary focus of these meetings is on discussion of recent activi activations and the sharing of lessons learned from the team leads. But they also use this forum to, for roundtable discussions um, on specific topics of, topics of interest and the continual evaluation of new tools and technologies. Another primary way that the members of this community stay in touch with one another is through asynchronous chat rooms. So each team typically has a team room that's used to stay in touch with one another and to share information on an ongoing basis within the team. There's also a global chat that they call the ATV room or All Things Lost. And like the Leadership Coalition, membership is open to anyone within this community. And this is where members of VOS get to know each other, they exchange ideas and share information in this channel, and it also serves as a really important space for the team leads if they need additional resources during an activation, they can post here. And because VOS has grown into this global community, there are people 24, around the clock that are available and listening if they need extra resources. So now that I've given you a feel for how, how they communicate and share information as a community, I want to talk a little bit about virtual operational support to give you a feel for how it works in, a, in an emergency activation. So as I mentioned earlier, each team is free to define the processes and protocols for coordinating with the response team on the ground. And there are a lot of variations on this. So there's no way to speak generally. But many of the teams share common tools and procedures. And so I'd like to draw on my experience working with one of these teams, so Pacific Northwest Team 2, to give you a feel for how virtual operational support gets enacted in a disaster. So during, an, and, and these tools are actually common across the teams. So um, these common communication protocols and Shared tools allow them to share resources across the teams fairly easily. So it may not be exactly the same, but there's enough commonality that this is sort of the generic model. So um, let's see. During an activation, there are two primary channels of communication for sharing information. One is the VOST workbook, and the other is the incident room. So I'm going to talk about those two. 
So the VAST workbook, a shared spreadsheet, acts as the information backbone. It's a living document used to share information between the VAST team members and the team on the ground throughout the activation. The main page of the workbook provides details about the assignment list for the current operational period and important updates coming from the incident management team on the ground. Members of the VOST also use the workbook to provide information about their availability and to log in and out for their work activities, work shifts. And that's so that it's clear for everybody who's available and who's working, and it also helps to track their hours. The results of social media monitoring efforts get recorded in here in the search results tab here, along with links to the content their assessment of why it's important and their evaluation of what the severity of it is. At the end of the day, the workbook is saved in an archive format, functioning as um, a formal record of what happened that day. And many of the forms within the, or many of the tabs within this workbook mirror the, the formal forms used by the incident management team on the ground. So moving to the incident room, this is where the conversation takes place between both the VOS team and the team on the ground. At the start of an activation, the VOS team lead creates a separate chat room referred to as the incident room. Membership in this room is restricted to only those VOS members who are, who are currently participating in the activation and the team on the ground. The incident team uses this channel to share the, late, the latest information coming from incident command. For example, they'll often post in a link to the morning briefing so that the VOST members can attend virtually. They also use this space to provide the latest, the latest breaking information from incident command and to post their updates and images so that those can then be um, translated into social media content. This is where VOST members on an ongoing basis discuss what they're seeing on social media and help evaluate it with one another. And on incident command, there's typically at least one person following this conversation at all times, so they have a sense as well. So now returning to the benefits we identified from Shadow Lake, these same, these same benefits still hold true, and in many, in, uh, in a sense are much more robust. Because now rather than a small bounded team, it's expanded to a larger global team. But I would also add to this something that, that I think is also an important contribution, that as the VOSS community has grown and shared their experience and, and resources across teams, um, the members of this community gain experience across a wide variety of circumstances, giving them a breadth of experience that would not have been possible otherwise. So in conclusion, I'd like to say that I don't think the specific details of how VOST operates or whether VOST is even a long-term solution is really what's important here. Um, I think this group are the, digi are the digital pioneers that invented something where nothing existed. So they pushed the idea forward. And looking at the framework that they bootstrapped together, it's simple yet effective and highly adaptable. It allows them to continually rethink and redefine virtual response in an environment that is itself continually changing and evolving. As we think about the design of new solutions for emergency response in a digitally connected world, we should be moving towards solutions that possess these same qualities. So that's, uh, so that's the end of the first section. Um, and now I'd like to um, shift gears and talk about a portion of my current research that stems from, stems from my involvement with VOST. And I'm going to start by giving you some background on my initial approach, what started as an, in, an initial collaborative pro, um, project, followed by my work on the Carlton Complex wildfire that made me rethink what I was doing and then look at the problem a different way. Um, I'm going to talk about the analysis I did after Carlton that led me in a completely different direction. Um, and then I repeated that in 2015, repeated that analysis live in 2015 to evaluate it. And then I'm going to talk about where I am right now and where I think I'm going to go with it. So within Project EPIC, we have 
um, a fairly sophisticated data collection server, um, and tools that allow us to capture social media conversations um, related to disaster events and, and topics of interest that we have. And uh, throughout my involvement with VOST, whenever I've worked on an activation, I've gathered data at the same time that I often use post-event for analysis. So um, I think in early 2014, I started using a tool called Tableau, which was, is an interactive visualization tool that made it easy to take the, the tweets that I was looking at and create information that I could then share with the boss. And my thinking was, there was an opportunity, to hear, opportunity here to look at, could I use the aggregated Twitter information in a way that would provide new insights for the boss team? So that was where I started with that. And I tried it, I, I tried it out on multiple non-emergency events in the spring. And what I would do is, at the end of the day, I would extract the data do some analysis, generate a summary report that I then handed off to the VOS team leads um, so that they had that information going into their morning briefing the next day. So that was the idea. And I tried it on the USA Pro Challenge, a bike race. I tried it on the X Games in Aspen. And then uh, later that summer when Chris Erickson was going to fire in Washington State, she called me and asked for my help. And so she was, um, and I thought, okay, here's a great opportunity. I'm going to try this on a fire. Is that is that a fire jumper? The middle? No, that's uh, somebody on a snowboard. Oh, upside down snowboarder. <laughs> Sorry. <Yeah. laughs> they do <laughs> crazy stuff on snowboards and snowmobiles. Sorry. And, yeah. So there you go. Um, So as part of my analysis, I just want to give you a little bit of background. What I was doing with the Twitter data was to make my analysis more meaningful. I would take the sources that I would, I would, I would take the content and I was classifying it. I used a standard set of categories for the most frequently occurring pieces of information. So, um, I, and these are a list of, I was figuring out whether the, whether the person or the content came from an individual source. Um, someone within the, an individual within the emergency management community, official information sources around the disaster, mainstream media, news aggregation, social media, or spam, or unknown was the default. So when Chris Erickson called me and she was heading to the Carlton Complex fire, I started a data collection midday on, on uh, July 18th. And at the time, the fire was about 39,000 acres. And later that evening, extreme weather conditions caused the fire to blow up overnight by over 100,000 acres. It ended up being one of the worst fires in Washington state history. In the middle of the night, it burnt through, the town, through two towns, Pateros and Twisp, destroying over 300 homes. It knocked out. Um, power and cellular infrastructure, so there were major communication issues surrounding this fire. Um, and so during the fire, I provided a lot of reporting to the team on the ground, but there was almost no communication between me and the incident management team. So after the fire, I got together with the um, public information officer and her team. And we talked about some of the value that the reports provided. But there was a comment that she made during the discussion that stuck with me. And she said, she told me that she, although she really appreciated the information that I was providing for her, especially in intense incidents, what she really needed to know was what she didn't know, is what she said. And that I know from experience, if I step back and I thought about what a VOS does, a VOST is about providing enough resources to catch the information that might slip through the cracks. And so, and, and it's, very, it's very difficult looking at Twitter. It's easy to find the common stuff. The, there, there are information sources that dominate the conversation. It's really hard looking at the content of a tweet to pick out whether it comes from an individual or a local source, whether it's the stuff they're trying to prevent from slipping through the, the cracks. So I stepped back from that and I started thinking about what I'd done and the work I'd done on the reporting. And my thought was, I wonder if I can take what I've already done and just look at it in a different way. 
if I, I may not be able to get to the tweets that are coming from those sources, but maybe I can reduce the number of tweets that you look at by excluding sources that I think are unlikely to contain that source of information. So I know from experience with Twitter and disaster that, that information coming from official sources, mainstream media, news aggregators, um, things that we've identified as spam, and then retweet tweets are also redundant information. So my thought was, what can I do? How much can I reduce this? So without changing anything, just using the data that I'd already categorized, in Tableau, I filtered all of that out. And the results were really surprising. So without changing anything, just using the classifications that I'd already done, I was able to eliminate between 82 and 88% of the tweets. And just to give you a perspective on that, this is a graph from the highest volume day of the fire. So when the, when the fire blew up overnight, at 9 a.m. in the morning, all the news media stories hit, and the tweet volume went through the roof. So at that, um, at that highest value point, there were 350 tweets, and I filtered it down to 68 tweets, which is, a one, is doable with one person, which is very significant. So I felt like this was really a, a promising path to go down. But the, the thing that was most striking about it was when I looked at the search results, it was rich in terms of information coming from the ground. And when I did further analysis, about 50% of that was information coming from individual and local sources, which is much better than what we deal with in general. What was also really striking was that often when we're doing social media monitoring, we're looking at pieces of information in isolation. And when you filter out all of the noise, you're able to start connecting what's happening both over time with individuals and interactions between people on the ground. And this is from a fire which there's typically less um, local information that emergency responders value. But as the complexity of these fires grow and another more diffuse events, being able to get to this content could be really important. So knowing that I didn't use a very systematic approach when I did the first analysis, I backed up and I started from a clean data set. And um, I reclassified, so I, I set a, a threshold and I reclassified all sources that occurred at least on average once per day during my time period. And then once I had the data reclassified, I randomly sampled a thousand records from both the tweets that I filtered out, excluding retweets so that it would be similar, um, and then a thousand tweets from the ones that I thought that were high probability of being individual and local. And then I, I analyzed the contents of those tweets. So looking first at the tweets set that I <coughs> sampled from those that were filtered out, First of all, I found no emergency relevant information in that data set. Um, and it was dominated by mainstream media, which is not really a surprise. Um, and the only individual content that I found were typically from the personal accounts of emergency responders. This is an example of a couple <coughs> tweets from that set. And given that it's from within the emergency response community, um, it's information that's known to emergency responders, and the, and the boss members felt like that's fine to filter out. So then, uh, shifting to the individual or to the other data set, individual looking for individual and local content, right at 50% of them came from individual and local sources. And so I wanted to look at what those tweets contained. So I coded them in terms of what types of content they had, and also what scope that information had. So was this content meant for a general audience, or was it locally specific? And then within that, was there emergency relevant information? So that's how we broke it down. Um, and looking at this, you can see that the, it was dominated by information sharing. And you can also see with the light blue that a large portion of this was focused on local information. 
So given these results and knowing that I didn't do it during an incident, I did it post it was to have an opportunity to do to trial this on an actual fire or a disaster. Um, and then the following summer, I did have an opportunity to do it on a series of fires, actually. So typically, a VOST activation or a, an incident activation is 10 days. So ten, teams work 10 days on, 4 days off. But in this instant, due to the circumstances, we were able to do, work across multiple fires over a 21-day period. So the team worked for an extended period of time. Um, and also, it worked out that I ended up being that we ended up activating for a file, fire right in the same vicinity of the Carlton Complex fire. So um, it gave me a chance to see how much of my information that I'd already classified could be reused because the sources were redundant. The sources overlapped. So I was working with the Pacific Northwest Team 2, which is a federal Type 1 team. Um, type 1 teams are the highest level of response in the U.S., responding to the most severe incidents. So we were activated for the Wolverine Complex, which was just west of the Carlton Complex burn area. And they were assigned to the fire because of the events of the previous summer with Carlton. They wanted a Type 1 team in place and ready to go if things went bad. So a little bit about the um, Wolverine fire. It was fairly small, and there was not a lot of social media conversation, and that actually gave me a chance to work with the Voss team to figure out what our operating procedures were. So over the days of the Wolverine fire, I was able to work out a process where we would look at both the filtered results and the unfiltered results to validate that I was getting what they wanted. We could also, um, the classification scheme that I used, was a shared data set in a table that they could edit and adjust based on what they wanted. It was dynamically driven. Um, and so there wasn't much that happened. It gave us, and also uh, another part of the analysis, we were able to break out the embedded content. So we worked out a workbook format where I would divide the content in a way that in a, in a large-scale disaster we could start distributing the effort. And then on, on, the, on the morning of August 13th, one of the lost, one of the incident commanders came into the room and put us on um, standby alert. He said that the conditions were bad and that he wanted everybody available to be ready in case of an emergency. Um, and a couple hours later, he posted this photo. So there was a dry lightning storm that occurred that started 22 new fires. And one of those fires was burning over the hill into the town of Shalon, where the incident command team was based. And so they were in the process of packing up their tents and relocating and the, at the same time that the fire was burning into the town. So the Voss team took over communication for the fire as well as social media monitoring. So at this point, the tweet volume went up considerably. And so I was working as quickly as I could. Um, it, was our, it was my chance to try out this new strategy. So I was extract, extracting the data every hour, dividing up the content, and each of us had, had an account we were, we were managing the communications for while also monitoring social media in a distributed way. Um, and during this, I was able to, every hour, keep up with the new material and log the locally relevant information. And then finally, at the end of this activation on the 18th, we got a message from Incident Command that Twist, which was one of the towns that burned in the Carlton Complex fire, that things were escalating and that um, first responders were moving out of there as quickly as they could in retreat. And I added terms, so we didn't know whether we were going to be assigned to the fire or not, so I added terms to the data collection just in case. And I went to lunch and came back, and within an hour, we had over 10,000 new tweets. And I, when I did the filtering on this, and 
the filtering was ineffective. It had a lot of the emotional support tweets that happened. There were fatalities in the time that I was gone. And so it gave me a new data set um, that I can use to look at methods for, for filtering that can help in those circumstances as well. So this is a graph of the filtered and unfiltered moving from Wolverine and to Shallan. And you can see that the filtering was pretty effective at, at producing volume that I could manage. So moving forward, um, what, I'm, what I'm working on now is I work in, at CU in, a, in um, an organization called Earth Lab. And part of my research is working on building a classifier that will help classify these tweets in a way that we can then implement the filtering. Um, and I've pulled together a team. I have a web developer friend, and we're looking at doing hackathons moving forward where we can start building an application that can implement this in real time and start getting feedback from emergency responders about whether it, how it works and how to make it work better. Um, so that's where I'm at. Um, I'd love any feedback that you might have. Okay. Thank you.